I don't have anything off the top. Uh, so, uh, Sean, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, actually, maybe before we get to the Middle East, can we talk about Sudan? Sure. Um, the secretary saw that you put out a readout last night. Uh, the secretary spoke with General Burhan. Uh, first, I mean, can you say uh, how it's going in terms of the process of getting the, uh, the Sudanese armed forces into the talks in Switzerland? So that is uh, that continues to be an, an ongoing effort, and we're continuing to stress how uh, vitally important it is uh, for uh, for them to be there. Look for any kind of negotiation. And when we're talking about the ultimate goal here being a cessation of hostilities, a cessation of violence, you certainly need uh, both uh, military actors to be uh, part Part of that uh, conversation. We are continuing to engage with both parties um, separately. Uh, the RSF delegation is in um, Switzerland and are, are, are ready for uh, negotiations, but uh, outside of that, there is uh, far too much uh, additional work to be done, specifically in talking about some of the humanitarian issues and technical concerns. So that process has begun. And um, uh, discussions as it relates to uh, humanitarian actors, ensuring humanitarian access, achieving a a ceasefire um, that has proceeded with um, international partners and technical partners on what that roadmap will look like. And simultaneously, uh, we're continuing to press uh, to make sure that uh, both of these parties um, can participate in uh, negotiations to get this uh, process moving forward. Sure. I know that's the language you've been using that you know both parties need to participate. I mean, did you see any headway with, with the Sudanese armed forces in the call? With, with uh, the I don't have any specifics to offer beyond the, the secretary's call, beyond just saying that this this is something that uh, we are working uh, around the clock. The secretary obviously had uh, the chance to speak with uh, General Berhan yesterday uh, in Switzerland itself. Um, Special Envoy Periello, Special Envoy Hammer uh, continue to be deeply engaged uh, in representing the United States. Um, uh, outside of that, I, you know, I don't want to get ahead of the process. Just one more in Sudan. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, uh, the Sudanese army said today that it's going to open the crossing with, with Chad. I don't know if you have any Reaction to that human right, uh, humanitarian groups have been pushed for that. Purpose. So, I mean, this is something that the secretary spoke to uh, General Burhan about um, uh, yesterday, and it's certainly a, a, a welcome announcement. We're aware that the Sudan's uh, sovereign council has agreed to um, reopen the um, Andre border crossing with Chad uh, for humanitarian deliveries for three months. Um, we are going to continue to call on both the SAF and the RSF to facilitate um, unrestricted uh, humanitarian access through all available channels. We think that's uh, vitally necessary. And we think that specifically as it relates to that border crossing, restoring access from that point is an important step uh, in providing humanitarian aid to the many impacted Sudanese people. Sure. Um, let's go to Gaza, then I'll, I'll okay. talk to my colleagues as well. But uh, I know that, that uh, um, Admiral Kirby over at the, the White House uh, spoke at length uh, on this today. But I wanted to ask you, one of the things that he's uh, he kept saying was that this is um, the, the negotiations and uh, the discussions in, in Doha right now are very much about implementation at this point, that the broader framework has been agreed. Uh, could you explain that a little bit? I mean, sure. If, if, if not mistaken, uh, Hamas is actually said that we need to implement what the president proposed on May 31st. I know you're not, you wouldn't say you're taking the Hamas position on this, but is there a sense that, that it needs to be implemented, that there isn't like a room for more negotiations? Uh, so I, I would very much echo what uh, Admiral Kirby said, and I spoke a little bit about this earlier in the week in uh, response to, I think, a question Saeed had and a, and a number of you as well. It is our view, uh, and it continues to be the case, that the uh, broader framework of what the president laid out uh, at the end of May uh, has generally been accepted. But of course, this is a negotiation with uh, two parties, and this is a process, and you sort of see what the text of uh, the, the the agreement is, and there's a back and forth, and there's an exchange, and there is engagement. And so uh, we feel confident in saying that uh, the contours of what the president outlined on May 31st has been accepted, and what we are focusing on now, and what the talks are focusing on, is uh, working on the details of the implementation. Um, there, of course, are still gaps when it comes to some of the details. There are gaps when it comes to execution. Uh, there are specific implementing measures that need to be uh, agreed upon. Uh, but um, beyond that, I'm just not going to get into the specifics, Sean. Uh, I'll defer to my colleagues. Great. Uh, Jenny, Camilla, will I stick with the front row? 
Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, Kirby called this a promising start, but why? Just because they resumed talking? Is Has there been more? So as I said, um, uh, look, I, I, I will let the, the, the White House offer any additional um, uh, characterization to the Admiral's comments, but what I would echo is that uh, this is, uh, it is an important step. Um, as we've said, that in the lead up to this meeting, there we have already narrowed some gaps, and uh, the focus now is on some of the more specific specific implementation uh, and specific uh, issues as it relates to the agreement. There, of course, is a lot of work uh, that remains ahead. This is a complex uh, situation and a complex agreement, um, but the work is so important, and we're very uh, pleased that th th these, this process has, um, has, has taken place again. Do you have a sense of how quickly these negotiations could wrap up? I, I don't want to put a timeline on it, uh, Jenny. Uh, I, I don't anticipate that coming out of the, the talks that there will be a deal today. Uh, we expect this process to continue, but I'm just going to avoid putting a timeline on it. And then on Gaza, the yeah. health officials there say that this uh, death toll has surpassed 40,000 people. I was wondering if the State Department has any comments on that. So uh, I would echo what I have said a number of times this week, which is that any number above zero uh, when it comes to the, the number of civilians who have lost their lives over the course of this conflict is, uh, is, is, is saddening, is troubling, is heartbreaking. Uh, I think as President Biden himself said earlier this month, the Palestinian people have endured uh, sheer hell. Uh, and since October 7th, uh, too many uh, uh, men, women, children, civilians um, who uh, have had no role in, uh, in, in uh, are just impacted by a crossfire of Hamas's making. Um, we've urged and will continue to urge the Israelis to conduct uh, their military operation in a way to avoid civilian casualties. As I've said, there's a moral and strategic imperative there. But Jenny, since you asked the question, I, I want to highlight, though, that the fastest way to create improved conditions for all, including uh, the Palestinian people, including Palestinians civilians is for parties, the parties to accept uh, and finalize uh, this deal uh, for an immediate ceasefire, hostages released, and increased humanitarian aid and safe civilian return. And we really hope that with the process that restarted today, um, that that is what uh, is uh, awaiting for us at the uh, other side of the finish line. Uh, Camilla. Um, thanks. I know that you've spoken about this yesterday. Yeah. I guess I'm just following up to just check that this is still the case that um, Qatar has uh, said that they will make sure that Hamas participates in this round of talks. Obviously, we've seen a lot of statements coming from Hamas saying that they won't participate. Um, we know that they're not meant to be in the room with US and Israeli negotiators to begin with, so it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of difference this time round anyway. But just wanted to ask, is that assurance still there from the Qataris about today's? Talks are moving forward in Doha. That is, uh, that process is happening. Um, and there are uh, representatives on the ground there from Israel, from uh, the United States, from Qatar and Egypt. And uh, Qatar and Egypt uh, are, as part of that process, are mediating with Hamas. Um, and so you heard me say a number of times this, this week that uh, our partners assured us that uh, uh, Hamas would uh, be representative in one way, shape, or form, and they certainly would be part of the ongoing conversations, which uh, is probably necessary when we're talking about negotiations between uh, two sides. And so um, we have no doubt that uh, the current modality will be able to serve the, the purpose it's designed to. And I have a couple of questions on another part okay. of the I'll come back to you. Said, go ahead. Thank you. And very quickly, on, on, you know, uh, on just following up on my colleagues on the talks, I mean, what is really perplexing is the fact that the president laid out the plan on, on May 31. You guys took it to the, to the Security Council, UN Security Council. You, you got a, a resolution and so on. Why, why is there a need to have more talks? Why can't you just find a mechanism to implement what you have already agreed to with the rest of the world. So uh, for, anybody that, who's, yeah. for anybody who's actually probably been part of a negotiation process, it's probably not perplexing at all. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this is a process. It is a complicated process. And as I said to Sean, and as Admiral Kirby said just an, an hour ago at the, at the White House, uh, the focus now is, is working on the details of the implementation and details of execution uh, and specific implementing measures. There is no question as it relates to the 
contours that President Biden laid out at the end of May that was then uh, quickly supported by the international community, including the UN Security Council and much of the Arab world. Um, and it is one, uh, the, the contours of the plan that was echoed last week in the trilateral statement by President Biden, uh, the Emir of Qatar and the President of Egypt. So this is a process and we're gonna let this process play out. I'm not gonna get into the specifics. You know, that. I mean, just logic tells me that uh, everybody will be spared the heartache. If they say, okay, this is what we have, now let's find a way to implement it. And instead of going back to square one, instead of having... Don't think there is Netanyahu anybody going back to square one, Said This is a well, process, I mean, I and we, as I have said for what is probably now the, the fourth time, that this is what w there is there is broad agreement on the contours of what President Biden laid out at the end of May. What we are talking about now is some specific details, some specific implementing factors. There are, of course, still gaps and things that need to be bridged in that space, but when we're talking about the uh, overall framework, that has been generally accepted, and that mm -hmm. continues to be the case. Oh, well, the point, uh, Vidant, I mean, I know what you said yesterday about uh, uh, whatever is attributed to Mr. Netanyahu is basically allegation, alleged, you know, you said alleged, in fact, it was entitled my article about uh, what you said. But the Israelis, you know, different Israeli sources, different Israeli media, and so on, they insist that Mr. Netanyahu wants to renegotiate the Philadelphia crossing. Mr. Netanyahu wants to negotiate the Netsuin crossing. He wants to insist on a system that it's almost, you know, impossible to, if, uh, to, to vet, you know, whoever goes uh, to no the north and so on. He's saying basically, you know, it's like an impossible situation to arrive at. So now, uh, I know you said that it was alleged, but it seems that Mr. Netanyahu insists on these restrictions. Sorry, I know um, uh, you all have a have a have a job uh, to to focus on these things, but I, I try not to spend a lot of time worrying about um, unnamed sources and uh, uh, yeah. documents that may or may not have a veracity. What we're focused on is uh, playing a constructive role in the talks that uh, began today, and beyond that, I'm just not going to get into the specifics of the ongoing process. A couple more questions on the you know on the West Bank. You know, it's, there's been a settlement in a UNESCO site and so on. I wonder if you're aware of the report and if you have any comment on that. I've seen those reports, uh, Saeed, and uh, again, the, this administration has spoken out um, against Israeli actions that undermine territorial continuity for a future Palestinian state. Something like this would certainly uh, be that. Every single one of these new settlements would impede Palestinian economic development and freedom of movement and undermine the feasibility of a two-state solution. Uh, Simultaneously, Said, what we have said uh, a number of times uh, continues to be the case, which is that the Israeli government settlement program, uh, we find that to be inconsistent with international law, and we certainly oppose the advancement of settlements in the West Bank, and this uh, uh, would certainly be an example of that. If you indulge me one more, uh -huh. uh, Vidant, you know, just to follow up on what Jennifer yeah. mentioned about crossing the 40,000 uh, mark. I mean, this is more than 10 to 1 as far as the... I mean, you know, all lost life is precious and so on. But now we have at least 10 to 1 Palestinians that have died. When will enough be enough? Because I know you say, you know, one more, we don't want to see it. But the fact of the matter is that you've been saying this since last December, you know. And we have killing every single day. Every single day, no 24-hour go by without killing at least 36, 40, 50 Palestinians, most of them children. So, I mean, when will enough be enough? Said, what we are exactly focusing on is uh, trying to have a resolution that would allow the fighting to stop. That's why we have time and time again, and again, just a moment ago, I said that the best thing uh, for the parties to do to minimize impact on all, including the Palestinian civilians, is to accept uh, and finalize a ceasefire deal, one that is encompassing of uh, the hostages being returned, an influx of humanitarian aid, and um, broader diplomacy to happen for the region to get out of this endless cycle of violence. Okay. Tom, go ahead. Hold on. Yeah. The, the settlement announcement yeah. that uh, Minister Smotrich made yesterday. Do you think your opposition to it will stop this settlement being built? 
That is not uh, really for, for me to speak to, Tom. These are obviously uh, unilateral Israeli actions. And when it comes to uh, uh, the United States, not only have we had uh, made our perspective and our point of view on this incredibly clear, uh, how it is a detraction from Israel's security, how it takes us away from uh, a two-state solution, but we also continue to have uh, tools in our tool belt to um, uh, hold to account um, individuals um, who we may think be uh, contributing to greater insecurity in, in the West Bank. Uh, I'm not going to speculate on that okay. from here, though. I mean, that's a separate point, but this is a government announced settlement. This isn't an outpost. So, I mean, it's the same question, really. If you oppose it, I don't quite see why you can't stop it. The, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't really follow, Tom. I mean, you've opposed hundreds of uh, settlement announcements, and they, they are all then built. So what's the point of repeatedly saying you oppose them? It is important for us to make clear our perspective and our point of view, as well as to uh, raise these sometimes tough and difficult conversations with our Israeli partners, and we'll continue to do so. But doesn't it, I mean, doesn't it just expose the weakness of your position in that you can say something and say it's your policy, but clearly it doesn't have any effects on the ground? Uh, I would... Uh, take issue with that characterization, uh, Tom. These are not uh, actions that the United States is uh, party to, certainly not ones that we are involved in. Uh, ultimately, um, uh, uh, Israel is a, a sovereign country that's going to make its own decisions. Uh, that does not detract or change from the fact that when we see things, when we see policy decisions, when we see actions that we disagree with, that we think are not just in the interest in the United States, but also not in the interest for, of the region, uh, we won't hesitate to say so. It is not dissimilar from circumstances in other countries in which the United States is not party to those decisions, but when we see something we disagree with, we certainly will make our voices heard, and that continues to be the case here. Uh, I will also say that the, the bigger issue here, Tom, is that we want to see the, these kinds of things end, and that is why we're so committed to uh, getting to a two-state solution, because we think that is the only path forward for the region. And when we see things like this that are inconsistent with that, we won't hesitate to say so. Well, you want to see a two-state solution, but I mean, Smotrich himself said in announcing the settlement, we'll continue to fight the dangerous idea of a Palestinian state and establish facts on the ground. This is my life's mission, and I will continue it as much as I can. So that's what you're up against when you're saying you oppose the building of these settlements. Clearly, this will go ahead, and it will not just go ahead, but it will go ahead um, in occupied territory where you are arming the military force, which will facilitate its establishment. So you're saying you oppose it, but you're arming the military force that facilitates its establishment. We have a security relationship with the IDF, Tom. I don't dispute that. That, uh, that of okay, course, continues to be the case. How is building a settlement about self-defense of Green Line sovereign Israel? We don't think it is, Tom. We, we do not think that the expansion of the settlement program is in Israel's security interest. We think it detracts from a two-state solution and causes further instability and insecurity. I've said these things a number of times. The point that I'm making is that these are not actions that the United States is party to. Can I just follow up? Yeah, that? go ahead. Again, we asked, I asked about Ben Gavir and what he's done on the Temple Mount. And um, to Tom's question, you know, you mentioned tools and the U.S. toolkit. Um, you, the U.S. hasn't used any tools in that toolkit. Um, and I just want to understand, is that because these are U.S. government officials? These are also U.S. government officials that Netanyahu... You mean Israeli president. officials? Uh, sorry, Israeli government officials that you wouldn't use... You know, are you, is that because you can't use your So, Camilla, I would never, uh, I would never preview um, actions um, from up here that would uh, be inappropriate. Not but I only just bring in the it up because you mentioned the toolkit. Of course, uh, not of course, not in, uh, n not just in the context of Israel, but in any country, I wouldn't, uh, as it wouldn't preview actions from up here. Look, um, uh, when it comes to there are uh, across the world, when it comes to governments uh, that we engage with, whether they be partners, allies, or countries that we have adversaries relationships with. There are uh, uh, colorful characters uh, in any government. What the United States is focused on is the policy uh, and the policy decisions that uh, they pursue and the United States pursue, and particularly uh, one when it comes to uh, attempting to subjugate or change the status quo at uh, Temple Mount, Haram al-Sharif. Uh, we would take issue with that. And uh, expansions of a settlement program, we would take issue with that. We find both of these things to be a detraction of Israel's security and fuel uh, more insecurity and instability in the region. The uh, and we'll raise these and continue to have these very tough conversations. In terms of what actions we can take, Camilla, I'm not going to um, preview or speculate from up here. 
Okay, but it's fair to say that there haven't been any actions taken other than condemning it verbally. When it comes to uh, officials within the government, sure, that uh, can be a fair assessment to take. Um, but you have seen us particularly uh, when it comes to um, uh, actors in the West Bank who we have found to be uh, uh, sowing division, sowing instability, sowing insecurity. We have taken action, and we've spoken in, about that a number of times from up here. But I just, I mean, I will just remark that the, the reason that these actions are being taken by settlers in the West Bank is because they do get a green light from said government officials to be able to behave like that. But again, that's, you know, that to me that seems linked and that's why these questions are being asked, but I'll leave it. Great. Alex, go ahead. Thank you, Ben. A couple of questions. Can you discuss anything about Ksenia Karolina's sentencing in Russia for exercising her, her first uh, amendment rights in, in, on U.S. soil and any woman from the U.S. Embassy, are, are you uh, willing to impose any measures? So, um, Alex, uh, uh, there is probably a limit to what I can say here, given uh, privacy concerns. Uh, we are uh, continue to be aware of reports of a, a American citizen, a dual national American citizen, um, that had a uh, sentencing today uh, in Russia. Uh, for privacy uh, uh, reasons, I'm not uh, really in a place to get further, but I just want to be incredibly clear about something. Um, donating to a non profit organization, uh, donating to an NGO, uh, supporting uh, the Ukrainian cause and supporting the Ukrainian people as they uh, defend themselves against uh, Russian aggression, um, especially doing so on American soil, is uh, not a crime. Um, we strongly condemn the Kremlin's uh, escalating uh, domestic repression. Uh, and outside of that, as it relates to this particular case, we continue to raise this directly with the Russian government and continue to seek uh, consular access. Alex, you and many others here, we've talked about this a great deal. Russia has a track record of when it comes to dual nationals, uh, not uh, uh, recognizing their American citizen status and frankly being uncooperative uh, when it comes to things like uh, uh, meeting their obligations under consular conventions. But uh, we'll continue to remain deeply focused and engaged on this. Given the definition you just described, do you consider her, her arrest as wrongful? I've not, uh, we've not made any uh, formal determination, Alex. That's obviously a separate deliberative process. What I can say is just um, what I have seen in public reporting on uh, whatever uh, merits uh, exist in that, that um, uh, contributing money to a nonprofit organization, contributing money to efforts that uh, support the Ukrainian cause uh, in our eyes and from our point of view is, is certainly not a crime. Thank you. On Ukraine, we heard from the White House this morning, yeah. uh, they said that you have seen some, some Russian units uh, being pulled out, redirected. You have not seen any escalator rhetoric uh, from Russia. Once again, Ukraine proved to be right, and, and your escalation fear policy proved to be you know, exaggeration. Yeah. In that case, given this latest episode, are you willing to allow Ukraine to take this further step and strike deep inside Russia, which will allow Putin to actually remove not some of his units, but all of them. So, um, Alex, let me say two things, and then I am going to move on because I want to get to as many people because I have a hard out today. Uh, First, we have seen some uh, uh, Russia, Russian troop movement um, out of Ukraine uh, to deal with uh, the incursion that you and others have asked about, but I, I'm not going to do a military analysis from up here. Uh, separately, uh, there has been no change to United States policy when we come to when it comes to uh, cross-border attacks. What we're focused on is making sure that our Ukrainian partners have what they need to defend themselves from, from Russian aggression. Nagy, go ahead. Thank you. Can yeah. we go back to Sudan? Sure. Um, can you give us an update on U.S. humanitarian assistance to Sudan? Uh, I don't have a monetary update for you, Nike, but I'm happy to check with the team to see if there is a, a figure we can provide. What I can say is that um, this is something that we're deeply engaged on. Obviously, the secretary spoke about it with uh, General Burhan yesterday and would welcome the news as it relates to this border crossing with Chad. Uh, beyond that, we are continuing to call on the SAF and RSF to facilitate uh, unrestricted humanitarian access through any and all available channels. Uh, let's not forget that uh, Sudan uh, currently is one of the most dire 
dire humanitarian uh, situations in the world right now, and we're taking every possible effort to address that. One of the key reasons that these talks are ongoing right now is to make sure that we, along with international partners and other technical partners, have a roadmap and a plan when it comes to ensuring humanitarian access. With neither side showed up on day one's talk, can you please help us understand what are the sticking points? So uh, again, I'm not going to get into the specifics of the negotiations, but uh, to to clarify, we are currently engaged with both sides, and we continue to uh, stress the importance of having the um, uh, SAF uh, uh, come to Switzerland and and participate in in, in the negotiations jointly. Uh, that's obviously it's obvious that that would be necessary when we're talking about a cessation of hostilities or a cessation of violence. The RSF is in Switzerland, um, and they stand ready to negotiate. But uh, we're continuing to engage with both sides, and I'm going to let this process play out. If I may ask, uh-huh. uh, global uh, health yeah. emergency impacts. Um, does the State Department has any plan to update its travel advisories and um, to provide timely information? So I spoke a little bit about this earlier in the week. U.S. embassies in the region have issued alerts to U.S. citizens amplifying uh, the CDC's Level 2 travel health notice for MPOX. Uh, for further information on that, I would uh, defer to the CDC. Uh, at this point, we're not seeing any uh, major issues of flight cancellations, and we certainly don't expect that at this time. But this is an issue that we are um, uh, deeply engaged on. I I will also just note, since you asked, Nike, that to support the effort as it relates to MPOX, the United States is donating uh, 50,000 doses of the FDA-approved Genios vaccine to the DRC, uh, and we're also working with other countries, the WHO and other international partners, uh, to look at um, the the, the vaccine delivery situation and see what other uh, lines of efforts we can support. Go ahead. In the green. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Canadian doctor Ben Thompson, who volunteered in Gaza earlier this year, posted a video on X in which he tells the story of a doctor in Gaza who was forced to strip naked and stand in for two days by Israeli force, urinating and defecating where he stood. He was only allowed to treat his patients while naked. Uh, do you have any comment on that? So I've not uh, seen that uh, video, but if uh, those reports are accurate, certainly that would be uh, deeply troubling um, and just uh, outright offensive. And uh, uh, the if, if true, our, uh, the IDF should look into these allegations and hold to account any perpetrators. But again, I, d- I don't have more information okay, I have on two that more. beyond um, what you said. Two days ago, uh, Israel killed uh, pharmacist Dr. Juman, her mother, and her three-days-old twin in a strike. Uh, No other units were struck in that strike, which makes it a very precise and targeted strike. Since you are in direct contact with the Israelis, um, can you ask them, or do you have any opinion why would they they target um, and kill a grandmother, a mom, and a three-day-old twin? Uh, I don't have any specific information on this, and I'll let the IDF speak to their own operation. Okay, one more. I'm going to work the room because I have a hard enough. Go ahead. Yeah, on the sanctions announcement this morning, given uh-huh. the timing and the talks of potential chatter within the region, is there any sort of message or sort of an underlying response to the timing of sanctions on Hezbollah and the Houthis as of now in conjunction with Treasury? So uh, I would uh, certainly, what, these actions that we're taking are they're rooted specifically in um, the malign and destabilizing behavior that we have seen uh, both the Houthi and the Hezbollah networks partake in. I, I would not necessarily uh, equate it to any other other thing that it's happening in the region uh, since the onset of uh, the increased Houthi activity in the Red Sea that we have seen, the United States and the President have uh, made clear that we will take appropriate actions to hold uh, these networks accountable, and this is us in conjunction with the Treasury Department doing that. Go ahead. Uh, negotiations are being held without Hamas, and Geneva negotiations are being held without uh, an important party from uh, the uh, without the army has the United States lost its role uh, or being an effective mediator in the crisis of the Middle East? So I think I uh, spoke to both of these. First, in the context of um, Switzerland, uh, we're continuing to stress the importance of the SAF joining the talks. The RSF uh, is in Switzerland, and uh, they stand ready to join the negotiations. What we are focused on at this moment is uh, the humanitarian and technical uh, part of the equation, which we are continuing to move forward uh, in close coordination with international partners, humanitarian actors, and others. In the context of the Middle East, uh, as I said, the talks have started today, and uh, Egypt and Qatar are playing a role in mediating with Hamas, as they have in- had indicated to us uh, this week that they would do. Uh, go ahead. 
in the back. Yeah. Uh, it seems based on different reports and what the president himself laid out, there is a connection between the Iranian attack on Israel and the talks in Doha. President says that Iran could hold off on Israel attack if Gaza deal uh, reached. How these connections uh, has been built up? Based on what? Based on common sense, intelligence, or let's say the indirect talks that you are having with the Islamic Republic? So I'm just not going to speculate at all again. Uh, you've said, me and Admiral Kirby have said this numerous times this week. I'm not going to speculate on a potential uh, Iranian response. Uh, what we are focused on is t two things. One, um, taking every uh, possible effort to send a clear message to Iran through uh, partner countries and other channels that um, a, a, a response or retaliation would not be in anybody's interest and taking every possible step to de-escalate. Simultaneously, we're incredibly focused focused on getting these uh, talks uh, across the finish line. In the pink, go ahead. Thank yeah. you. President Lula gave an interview just today, and he has two proposals for Venezuela. Um, so he's laying out the possibility of a new election, but he also is asking for a coalition government. And he uh, was very strong in his um, demand for Maduro to give answers. He said that Maduro owes Brazil and the world an explanation. Um, any reaction to these possibilities as um, today they're meeting so in Colombia? I don't have a reaction on any policy proposal, but on the second part of your question, we certainly uh, would agree since the onset and conclusion of this election, you have seen the United States clearly and consistently uh, repeatedly call for a accurate publication of the vote tallies, um, because uh, from our perspective, and it's echoed in the recently released uh, UN panel of experts interim report that uh, the CNE fell short of basic transparency and integrity measures, and it didn't follow national legal and regulatory provisions. Uh, the uh, One of the key conclusions of this report is that there is no precedent for such an announcement of an election outcome without the publication of these kinds of details and these tallies. And so that's what we are continuing to press for. And uh, the United States is in coordination with international partners, including Brazil, of course, to support an inclusive uh, Venezuelan-led process to uh, reestablish democratic norms. Just a follow-up. Um, so Mexico um, made sure yesterday to um, live clear that they, they wanted um, the tribunal, the TSJ, which is what Maduro is asking to re try to take over the investigation within the country and instead of the CNE, which is what the rest of the region is proposing, is a, is a valid actor, the TSJ, which is a tribunal that is appointed by Maduro? Will that be a, a, a route? Uh, I'm just not going to speculate on that. What we're focused on is supporting an inclusive Venezuelan process to reestablish democratic norms. Ksenia, and then we got to wrap. Go ahead. Uh, so the State Department has told the Kosovo government that any unilateral and uncoordinated action to open Mitrovica Bridge to vehicle traffic, quote, increases the potential for violence and puts at risk both the local population and the lives of American soldiers and under other members of the NATO mission in Kosovo. Uh, Prime Minister Kurti, however, is not backing down. Um, he said that the bridge opening is not up for discussion. Peter Stano, um, the EU spokesperson, the spokesperson of uh, Borel, said uh, that the European Union, the entire Quint, all friends of Kosovo, the United States, key European countries, the European Union, went to Prime Minister Kurti and told him, quote, don't do it, don't take unilateral actions, don't open the bridge, but it seems he's determined to do so, end of quote. Today, uh, President uh, Osmani called the EU remarks racist and sided with Kurti, saying that she also poses the dialogue in Brussels about the bridge and that the bridge must be open. Um, Osmani comments came shortly after she was briefed uh, about uh, the um, security assessment of putting American soldiers um, who are serving in the K-4 uh, at risk. So my question, what will the United States uh, do to protect the lives of American soldiers uh, in Kosovo from unilateral actions uh, by the Kosovo government? And what kind of consequences, if any, uh, you will be imposing in case they put uh, the lives not only of American soldiers, but also everyone involved. So um, I've not I've not seen those comments or remarks, so I'm going to have to check with the team. But let me just say that uh, we certainly uh, won't hesitate to uh, do whatever is needed to hold uh, to make sure that U.S. personnel and our people are protected. But beyond that, I'm going to have to check back with the team. Uh, John, go ahead, because you had your hand up and then we'll wrap. 
Yeah. Yeah. And don't grab my one week. You did not give me a chance. You don't see me in the room. Please don't interrupt your colleagues. Go ahead, John. Mr. Ladan, I've been a journalist 25 years. Don't tell me how to treat my colleagues. You need to treat the journalists with respect. It's my fourth press briefing with you. You have it more. Jaleel, not everybody gets a question. John, please go ahead. Otherwise, I'm going to have been something. I'm happy to. I'm, I'm, I'm happy right to. Now. I'm happy to you end the briefing if you're not going to. Attitude. Like. If you treat a journalist like this, this is a shameful attitude. Go ahead, John. You and Matt are disgracing this podium, in my opinion. Go ahead, John. Does the U.S. government see the Doha negotiation as an opportunity to avoid? broader regional conflict. So when we have talked about the reasons for why we want to get this deal uh, across the finish line, certainly the potential for uh, the room for diplomacy that it could create to get this region out of this constant endless cycle of violence that we're seeing would certainly be a key pillar of that. What we're talking about, though, at the, uh, immediately is opportunities to make sure that the remaining hostages can be released, including American citizens, a greater influx of humanitarian aid. Uh, but yes, also uh, in making sure sure that um, uh, we can get to a future that is uh, conducive to a st two-state solution, get to a future where uh, we can make sure that Gaza is no longer a springboard for terrorism on the Israeli people. All of those things are certainly uh, part of the goal when it comes to this deal. All right. Thanks, President everybody. Trump, President Trump is absolutely right. You guys are shaming this country with your attitude.